And my first question is, um, why is effective political and civilian control of the military essential to democracy? That's a very good question, because any country needs, almost any country, needs a military. <clears throat> But part of democracy is that the decisions are not made by specialists, they're made by elected officials responsible to the people. And the military is almost unique in being a, a highly trained, highly professional instrument, and also somewhat insular. Everybody who's in the military for all practical purposes has been in it their whole life. It's a very hierarchical system. It depends on obedience to authority. And it has weapons. It has, it has the instruments of power. And if you have a situation where the military either runs the state, like in Pakistan, or is a state within a state, as in Chile, even today, I think, certainly in the past, um, many Latin American countries, uh, you don't have a real democracy. You don't have real decisions of the greatest importance to the society being made by, you, you don't have them being made by elected officials, by people who are responsible to the, to the public, to the people. And <clears throat> it's, not, it's not enough just to have the president be the commander in chief. You have to have a system where the civilian control is real control. It, it really manages things. It, on the other hand, it's also very important to respect that the military institution is a professional, highly trained, highly specialized force. And just as you don't want politicians making decisions about the details of how to run the health system, and you don't want teachers to make all the decisions, don't want teachers to make all the decisions about the educational system, but you want them to make some. It has to be a balance between civilian control and respect for the military profession. That's the challenge, it seems to me. What are the essential elements of civil civilian control? Well, the first is, it seems to me, that there be constitutional provisions that create a civilian in the chain of command. And my opinion is it has to be much more than simply that a civilian, even a civilian minister of defense, it is sitting on the top of what is essentially a purely military system underneath them. Um, so that you need a, a constitutional and legal structure And then you need to create the institutions within the national security system of the country and within the Ministry of Defense so that the civilian minister has civilian advice, civilian expertise. He is not totally dependent on the, on the military because otherwise he becomes a rubber stamp. What does it mean institutionally and or in substance? Well, the first requirement is that there be the appropriate constitutional and legal provisions. It's the National Security Act in the United States. It also requires a, <coughs> excuse me, it also requires, I think, that the Ministry of Defense include a significant civilian element, not necessarily all civilians in the sense that there are not any military officers in it, but that it's a, it's a civilian structure. There are more than just the minister and one or two special assistants trying to oversee the military. Um, the other thing is, and, and actually this goes back to the previous question, another element that's essential is that the military is not politicized. The military is a a professional organization that depends on the proposition of obedience to orders, not only the orders of the military, but the orders of the civilian. 
But it's very dangerous to a democracy if the military bec- has becomes divided into factions, some of which are in support of one part of the political system and some in the other. There are countries where that's true. It's equally important that the military not become themselves a political force. I, I said that a minute ago. In Latin America, traditionally, the military is not so much a real military designed to def- defend the country and participate in, at least in the past, designed to defend the country against foreign enemies. It's like a political party, often with the army and the Navy and the Air Force being opposed to each other. In Thailand, where they had this problem, the the periodic military coups would sometimes be called the annual Army-Navy game. Um, That's another, another, that's another element of a of a working system of democratic control. So I'd say the main things are legal structure, an institutional structure that provides real military, real expert advice on military and security policy issues to the minister and the commander in chief, and a system which protects the military against being politicized. What do you think of the process of the establishment of political and civilian control of the Hungarian military after regime regime change in 1989? I have to be honest. It was, what, 30 years ago? Um, And happily for Hungary, I was very much involved in it, but I don't remember the details. And there is sort of an interesting reason for that. At the time that I was most directly involved with it, the three countries that were most, not the only ones, but the three countries that were most significant from this point of view were Hungary, Poland, and the Czech Republic. And the situation in Hungary was quite different from either of those in ways that I think made establishment of civilian control and fitting a post-Warsaw Pact army military into a into a uh, democratic independent structure because in Poland the army was a huge symbol of nationhood of nationality in the Czech Republic and, and therefore very much respected very much idealized idolized almost whereas in the Czech Republic the memory of Munich in 1968 meant that the army was regarded as very much an instrument, either weak, as in the Munich case, or very much an instrument of the old system. Hungary was, fortunately, had neither of those two problems, and therefore, from an outsider's point of view, presented fewer difficulties. I'm sure it presented plenty of difficulties inside the country, but as to the details, I have virtually no recollection. I'm sorry. It's perfectly okay. What was your experience when you first confronted the confronted this issue and in one ca- what capacity? The civilian control of the, the, over the military? Um, interestingly enough, I had been involved in a little bit before I worked in the Pentagon. Because there was this period in the late 80s, before the, before the big changes, but where things were easing up in the Soviet Union and therefore in Eastern Europe as well. Um, And I had done some stuff for RAND. I'd thought about the issues in some respects, uh, even before I came into the Pentagon, because we knew that this would be one of the transformations, that you would go from a system in which all the Warsaw Pact countries had militaries that were nominally independent of the Soviet system, but in effect, there was a parallel structure where to some degree the militaries were in fact run by the Communist Party regimes in the countries, but to another degree they were run by the Soviet commanders in in the Warsaw Pact and working out that whole complicated, un- unraveling that whole complicated arrangement uh, was, a, was a major issue. And, of course, from the very beginning, uh, 
there was always the issue of NATO membership at the end of the process. And while there were various conditions for NATO membership, one of the most basic ones was the establishment of civilian control over the, the country's military, which involved lots of issues of reform, of adaptation of, of some quite technical levels of capabilities and others, uh, much more sort of cultural and institutional. What exactly was your role in supporting this process? Well, in the Pentagon, <laughs> we have a we have a system which, mat unsurprisingly, which it matches what I think ought to be. You have the civilian side called the Office of Secretary of Defense, and the military side, the Joint Staff. And we work closely together. We had uh, obviously there were always issues of what kind of assistance would we provide, what kind of advice would we provide, how did we establish relationships with the military. And as I say, one of the big issues, to my mind, in civilian control, and especially in a situation like this, where you had an army already, there were countries like Estonia, like the Baltic countries were the obvious ones, where there was no, you had to create an army, you had to create a military, not much of much of which was composed of people who'd been in the Soviet army, by no means all, especially at higher levels. But here, in the case of Hungary, you had an existing military that had a, had, you know, a real structure, it was genuinely Hungarian. Probably the Hungarian military was more national and independent than some of the others, probably not so much as Poland, probably a good deal more than the Czech Republic. And we found that often military people thought that, uh, not specifically in Hungary, but I think it was a general problem. Military people thought that civilian control meant things like the civilians decided on all the promotions, which is a formula for politicizing the military. And it, the, diff, the problem was to create a system where the military were under the direction of the civilians, and yet the civilians also, res it's what I call respecting military professionalism, that it was not that the military were going to go out and, the biggest issue was, was uh, um, promotion, control of what officers reached the top, because there is a temptation in any system to favor the military officers who are sympathetic to your view of policy and so on. That, up to a point, the military have to be loyal, they have to support the, the institutions and they have to carry out the orders that are given by the civilians. But the civilians shouldn't try to run the military as an institution internally, and that's a, that's a tough balance. What were the most difficult problems you had to confront? Well, one important one, remember this was from the perspective of the Defense Department. What, what should the militaries of a relatively small country that was almost certainly going to be a part of NATO, how does, what, what should be the character of that military? To some degree, and I, I believe this was the case, in the Warsaw Pact time, the, the, Central, the Warsaw Pact allies were not designed to be frontline forces. They were going to be. They were going to hold. They were going to provide support. They were going to deal, provide political participation, as in the case of Prague in 1968. Um, and the question was. For relatively small countries, if you try to duplicate the American military, but in miniature, you get you don't get anything. It's not big enough. You have to have certain areas that the countries will partic will participate in. So there was an issue how you how you restructured the militaries so that you had a useful force, which was a national force, but also was potentially useful in the 
it, it, one of the phrases was that these countries should be contributors to security of the alliance, not just beneficiaries. And that was, at technical levels, that was a tough problem. You also had the problem that in the case of Hungary and, and the other Warsaw Pact states, as opposed to the Baltic countries and the former Soviet republics, you had an existing military. You were not going to fire everybody. You were not going to do what they did in, in East Germany. In the DDR, essentially, the whole, the whole DDR officer corps was just sent home. I mean, a few specialists were held over, but basically it was, they were simply all replaced. You couldn't do that. You shouldn't do it. And so the question of how you, how you, or how Hungary was going to deal with the problem that they were taking over an, a military that already existed and already had certain patterns and yet was going to have to change some of its ways of doing things, that was dumb. Then, of course, there was, there was issues of how you, how you trained, how you, one of the great strengths of the American military is the non-commissioned officer corps which does not really exist in, lot, in lots of armies, even many Western armies. Um, and there was always a danger that we were going to try to make little American militaries out of all these countries. And that wouldn't have worked, and it required a certain amount of, yes, thank you, Colonel. That is how it's done in the United States, so we think that's just fine, but we're not going to make it be done every, every other place. And, and don't you think that's your mission? So, but there were there were a lot of programs for exchanges, for advice, for people to be embedded. We set up, if I remember correctly, all of the countries had a partnership arrangement with the National Guard in a state. I don't remember who Hungary was, got, but I'm sure there was one. Uh, and also, to some degree, that involved because of a language issue. In many cases, I'm sure including Hungary, although I don't remember specifically, that involved in finding people in the American military who were temperamentally suited, but also to be blunt spoke Hungarian, because <laughs> uh, that was a huge, a huge advantage. How did you manage, manage this Well, n let me go back. And then there was yeah. another thing that I talk about, I mean, to remember more. We had a certain amount of money. <coughs> We had a certain amount of money, modest by Pentagon standards, but substantial. It was in the hundreds of billions of dollars that could be allocated to specific projects. And so, of course, there was a lot of effort on what projects were those allocated to. In addition, in that era, probably more than today, the expectation was that the main mission of the new allies' militaries just as we sort of believed the main mission of the old Allies militaries would not be territorial defense of Europe. It would be peacekeeping. It would be engagement with third world militaries. It, and that was a whole new, that was a whole new role for both, but the, the former Warsaw Pact states, that was an expectation. So there was an issue of what would the military before what kind of mission should they have, and how do you how do you train them? There was also the issue that, and I, I, I believe I'm almost certain this was the case for Hungary. The militaries had a, a stock of almost entirely Soviet-produced equipment, and there was the issue: how are you going to maintain this? How are you going to replace it? At what pace can you replace it? With either indigenous to produce, but most of it would have to be imported. That, of course, set off all kinds of commercial issues. And so this was also, to some degree, complicated by the fact that all of the countries in question were interested in becoming members of the EU as well as members of NATO. And the EU and NATO didn't always see eye to eye, not so much on military issues at this point, but on commercial issues. How did you manage these problems? That you faced? <laughs> well, it worked out all right. I guess that's the that is the short answer. It was a major focus of what we were doing it was in the in the Pentagon. Um, it 
it involved a lot of people's time and effort, a fair amount of money. Um, we, what were the things? Well, I mentioned the partnerships with the National Guard. There were, there was a fairly substantial, not really so much exchange program. Well, some of it was training in the end. We had some opportunities for training of Hungarian and other former Warsaw Pact military in the United States or with uh, American units. Uh, a lot of it was done on, on a NATO basis, because all of this, as I said, from our point of view, and I think from the point of view of most of the other countries in the alliance, the point here was looking toward the eventual participation of Hungary and the other countries in the alliance. So there were all kinds of alliance issues. Uh, it, was an, it was an alliance subject with alliance standards and so on. And our last question is, what do you know of the current situation in Hungary? Oh, I admit almost nothing about the, about the Hungarian military. And that's a good thing. Hungary has its problems. I, mean, I know quite a bit about what's going on in Hungary. I know almost nothing about what's going on in the Hungarian military. And it's, it's, I used to joke, I, I love maps. So when I, one of the, one of, when I was working on a problem, I would get maps of the country, including often the capital city. And the joke was that you didn't want to be a country that had a map, of, a big map, you know, the size of that screen over there, of its its capital city, because it was Port-au-Prince in Haiti, Sarajevo, Mogadishu, whatever the capital, Freetown, the, no, Freetown's the capital of Liberia. Uh, no, Monroeville, uh, whatever the capital of Sierra Leone is, whatever the capital of Rwanda is, you, you didn't want to be on that list. 